Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint, Ben Richard Fields. On the program tonight, we have Scott Schmidt, Republican for California Assembly District 7, and Eric Frame, Independent for California Senate District 8. Uh, and uh, first of all, let's start with you, Scott. Uh, you're running uh, for, uh, for the uh, Assembly, and you're running against uh, Kevin McCarty uh, in uh, California Assembly 7. You made the top two by uh, coming in with, uh, what, 237 votes as a write-in candidate? Correct. No other write-ins, I take it? No, only yeah. one. Yeah, yeah that's, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, they don't say every vote counts, but you proved that it does. You made the, the top two. Congratulations. Now tell me, why did you decide to run as a write-in candidate, and why are you running uh, in the, uh, in the uh, November election? Well, what happened was, in the middle of the night, I was filling out my ballot, and I thought to myself, why is only one guy running? And why is no one even trying to upend this guy? Uh, and then soon after that, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to run. I'm tired of the unaffordable housing there is. I'm tired of the homelessness there is. I'm tired of the corruption and the bribery that goes on within the government. So I want to be able to take a lead to take care of all those issues that are collectively a problem right now. Well, homelessness is obviously a huge problem in Sacramento. And homelessness can be solved in any number of ways. You can go after the symptoms or you can go after the cause. How would you attack the, pro the, the problem of homelessness in California, particularly in Sacramento? Well, what I would do would be um, give some type of incentives to charities and other organizations to be able to house them, help them, and also be able to put them back on the jobs, give them jobs in general, be able to make them get back to the labor market. Because if you don't do that, then they're going to continue to be fed, be housed, and that's not enough. So we need to really combat the real symptom, which is they don't have a job. They don't have a way to retain a uh, livelihood. Well, let's look at some of the root causes of, of, of house homelessness in California. Some of the homeless do have jobs, simply can't afford uh, the sky, you know, the, the increasing rents in the Sacramento market. Sure. We're, we're starting to uh, look like San Francisco and the Bay Area uh, in that respect. And certainly, you can look at the cause of, uh, of, of high housing costs. What do you think is causing housing prices to be as high as they are? Well, that's easy. I'm actually a realtor by trade. So the number one issue is they're just too expensive to build. Okay, and why is it too expensive to build? Because there's permits being put on, there's CEQA uh, requirements you have to follow. Uh, there's all these regulations that are put in place that don't allow affordable housing to be built as fast as possible. Well, let me ask you a, just a nuts and bolts question. Okay. You said it costs a lot to get permitted. Mm -hmm. How much does it cost to, to permit before you even lay a brick or, or, or pound a nail? How much does it cost to permit a, a new Single, single family home. Well, to be honest, I'm not really entirely sure that the actual cost because I'm not a contractor by trade. However, I believe it's north of 100, 100 grand north. I've, I've heard 25,000 for a, a typical home in the Sacramento area to get started up. I think, I think you're probably closer at, at the 100 grand rate. Uh, I, it, I know it's pretty that. high. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and where is that money going? It's going to it, it, the city and the county. It's going to people that try to, you know. It's going to the government. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So but you have to pay off the government, you know, 25 to 100 or more yeah. thousand dollars before you lay a brick or pound a nail. Correct. So that starts out putting home, uh, houses out of the reach of most, or a lot, your, your typical, you know, seven, eight dollar an hour person, right? The, the only housing that's being built right now is luxury housing because that's where the profitability is. Right. If the per permits are high enough, I mean, they can still build luxury apartments and people will still pay for it. Mm -hmm. Right now, we need affordable housing. If we don't have that, the homelessness is going to increase and everything else will along with it. You also mentioned uh, the rules and regulations, CEQA, and, and the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the regulatory red tape that sure. you have to do to build a house. Give, give me an idea of what's involved there. Uh, when it comes to CEQA and stuff like that, you need to have uh, certain permits to be able to make sure you're doing the work properly. So. You're paying the government effectively again to make sure that you're in code and you're allowed to build. That's pretty much what it knows down to. Okay. And are the, I mean, the CEQA is, is environmental mm -hmm. review. Are those necessary to provide uh, a pristine environment? Or is there a better, less intrusive way of doing it? Either, you know, go ahead, either of you. Well, I would argue that having homelessness and more homelessness is actually worse for the environment than housing people because we see more and more trash on the streets and in our rivers and uh, a buildup of urine in our rivers and down our levees and canals as well. So it's actually more environmentally friendly to allow housing to be built as quickly and uh, as quickly as possible and at an affordable rate. So um, 
pe we can get people off the street and get that. One of the ways that that's, that's being suggested for building housing uh, in, a, in an affordable way is, is tiny homes mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Would you support uh, deregulation? It would take a hell of a lot of deregulation in order to make tiny home uh, building uh, possible, zoning requirements, regulatory requirements, red tape, so forth and so on. Absolutely, and it's something I've pushed for down at City Council at Sacramento all the time. Um, we keep getting promises from our mayors that they're going to build a thousand tiny homes in the next two years, but we end up with 68 or fewer. Um, something I always see also is all these empty buildings we have all over Sacramento. We have an empty Arco Arena, we have an empty Hostess factory, we have empty uh, former apartment buildings that we really can be using to start housing people instead of keeping these empty. Why are they empty? Well, I hear that uh, landlords and the owners of those uh, buildings have tax breaks and incentives to keep them empty and collect dust. This is what I heard from word on the street, uh, word of mouth. Um, and um, frankly, I think, I think we need to, that, <laughs> yeah, we need to completely reverse that. Uh, we need to give incentives to landowners and property owners to house people instead of giving them incentives to keep a building empty. It doesn't make any sense. I like to add too that actually a lot of property is actually owned by the government right now. True. In Sacramento. A lot of that ground could really be used for affordable housing to be built. Are you talking about uh, publicly owned uh, real, uh, land? Raw, raw land? Correct. Okay. Wh what areas are you talking about? Uh, North Sacramento, the rail yards. Okay. A lot and, of that. Well, the rail yard, yards, are, uh, that's under construction or something or another is going on down there, right? Well, I, as of right now, I mean, how long has it but been that, vacant? That, that's looks to me like they're talking about mo mostly luxury housing in, in that That's area. true. Yeah. No doubt, no doubt. Correct. And, and again, it goes back to the fact that it costs way too much money to get the permits and get the, uh, to pass the, the, the regulatory red tape to build a house in the first place. Yeah, I, I think a bigger issue is right now the government's trying to make or choose winners and losers, and right now they're making only the top elite people who have the money to buy housing, everyone else becomes a loser because no one can afford to live here anymore. Um, one of the... Uh, I watch, I've been watching politics for, for you know, a number of years. Okay, sure. And I've noticed that millennials, you guys, I guess, you, you qualify both of you as millennials? Well, yeah, I, 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 I guess so. I mean, we're yeah. actually, we're old souls. Yeah. Old souls. <laughs> uh, but people who are younger than I, uh, at one time or another, have been both Bernie Sanders fans and Ron Paul fans. In 2008 and 2012, Ron Paul got a huge... Uh, support from younger people and in uh, 2016 the same thing happened with with Bernie Sanders and I see a, quite a bit of overlap between Sanders supporters and Ron, Ron Paul supporters uh, do, you, do you see the same thing I, I do actually I think a lot a lot of it speaks to authenticity people look at these older men that actually seem like they care and people are drawn to that especially younger people they're tired of the same BS we deal with it every day, the status quo, I mean, the establishment has done nothing to help us. So well, we need something different. Of course, Ron Paul is retired pretty much from uh, politics, sure. uh, you know, in any active role. But he's still out, out there uh, going ahead and, uh, and, and endorsing people. He's endorsing people, uh, for instance, like uh, Murray Sabra, who is the uh, libertarian candidate uh, in uh, New Jersey for, uh, for senator. He's running against, uh, you, you mentioned corruption in your... Mm -hmm. uh, and your uh, uh, opening statement. Yep. Well, the, the incumbent senator in New Jersey uh, just got off, just was, he wasn't acquitted, he uh, avoided being convicted by a hung jury of bribery, corruption, conspiracy, uh, and uh, uh, theft of honest services, uh, a, number of, uh, a number of corruption charges. Hung jury let him off, so he's still running for Senate. He'll, he's leading slightly in the polls against a self-funded uh, uh, pharma executive uh, who's running as a Republican. Murray's coming in third. He's got a, a Ron Paul endorsement, but he still can't get into most of the polls, most of the, uh, most of the uh, debates and so forth. Uh, would you be willing to take, uh, both of you, would you be willing to, and would you welcome either a Ron Paul endorsement or a, uh, or a uh, uh, Sanders endorsement. I mean, if they like my platform, my views, I'd love anyone's endorsement. Um, I'm not going to shy away from that. However, I would say I, I don't know whether or not that would make an impact in my race. That's what really matters. I would I would accept both endorsements, and in fact, I'll reach out to both of them. But um, it would <laughs> it would be a long shot, I think, uh, particularly with Bernie. I would say because I feel like he's got a lot of reins on him right now, and he's not really. I haven't heard him endorse many people lately, 
But his endorsement would particularly be helpful in my district, well, you which got, you, is you mainly have, Democrat. Yeah, you guys have overlapping districts. You're yeah. Senate, you're, you're Assembly, so uh, your Assembly district plus one other Assembly district makes your Senate district, is that mm -hmm. correct? Right, right. And, right. And it's downtown Sacramento and, uh, and uh, I guess what, further north? For Some of North years? Sac, yeah, yeah. as well. Okay. So what I'm guessing, uh, just you know, looking at the demographics there, you have lots of state workers, lots of, uh, uh, well, I think lots of state workers probably is, is, is it in a nutshell, is that correct? That's very yeah. correct. Okay, uh, and uh, riddle me this, why are state workers uniformly uh, voting Democrat? Well, we have a Democratic supermajority here in California. So. I know, but it's not, I mean, it's even more so in your two districts. Uh, there was no Republican uh, opponent to Richard Pan. You know, there was a Libertarian who you edged out. Uh, that's actually wrong. There was a, a ride-in Republican. But he did. Okay, uh, that's probably but, the reason why he. But who, who never, who never, who didn't show up on the, who didn't show up in the results. Yeah, right. correct. Uh, there was no uh, opposition other than write in uh, in, in your race mm -hmm. against McCarty. Why is it that a Republican doesn't even bother to try, or a serious Republican? There's no serious Republican effort in Sacramento. Why, why is it the state workers are so uniformly Democrat and, and uh, not Republican? I think because they're, they're the ones who actually benefit the most from having a Dem uh, candidate sometimes. Uh, they, they try to speak on behalf of uh, the, the voters and say, you know what, I'll be able to raise your, your uh, pay, I'll be able to do this and do that. It's all promises and a lot of it isn't really delivered. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But they simply offer, I'll do this for you and do this for you and this, do this for you, you know, ad nauseum, and that's really what it comes down to. Both of, you know, both of you, I'm, I'm, well, I know you, and, and I'm sure, I'm assuming, Eric, have a reason for getting into politics being uh, solving problems, mm -hmm. solving real problems, homelessness being one, and, and you mentioned a couple of others. And we all want to solve those problems. Um, different strains of politics try to solve problems in different ways. Uh, Democrats tend to want to have the government do it. You're running as a Republican. Republicans tend to at least talk about uh, having a problem solved in the private sector. Libertarians really mean we want to have problems solved in the private sector. Sure. Where, where, do you, where do you lean on the libertarian-republican uh, divide? Talk the talk versus walk the walk. I'd say for the most part, I actually believe that government should get out of our pockets in principle, get out of our pockets, be able to leave us alone uh, in our livelihood and leave us alone when it comes to our personal lives. And Eric, would you argue that there is a role, a stronger role for the private sector or for the public sector in solving the, 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 you know, the, the commonly agreed upon problems yeah. we're talking about? The future I envision is people solving people's problems, not government pushing things onto people, which is what we see right now uh, with too much, too many taxes, too much regulations, keeping the private sector at bay, basically. Um, so it's private sector and people power that I believe in as to something that will actually solve problems. Right now, the, this corrupt California government is everything coming out of it I, I basically disagree with. And I think, I think maybe if we get people in office that have the right voice and the right attitude and, and uh, the moral standards, then maybe we could see a government that works for the people. But in the end, I believe it's going to be the people that solve our own problems. It's, it's very difficult to break the duopoly, to break the re Republican-Democratic duopoly, and in California, the, uh, Correct. the essentially the Democratic monopoly. Uh, and in Texas, it's hard to break the Republican monopoly or Democratic Republican monopoly. In Texas, the Libertarian Party, uh, Texas gubernatorial candidate, Mark Tippetts, who's a strong candidate. I mean, this is a guy who is the, uh, uh, an ex, uh, uh, you know, recently was a uh, city councilman. He uh, is a person who was born in Mexico uh, and is bilingual, bicultural, understands relationships between Mexico and, and Texas, which is, you know, they're very strong trading partners, always have been, always will be. Uh, and he's placing third. Uh, they're actually polling him in uh, some of the polls in, in Texas, polling a strong third with a huge undecided uh, in, the, in the vote against, uh, uh, against uh, the Democratic candidate, Lupe Valdez, and Greg Abbott, the Republican incumbent. But the debates, uh, the one hosted coming up in September, ho a debate hosted by Nexstar 
Communications, which own, owns a dozen television stations in Texas and will be simulcasting on San Antonio and Dallas and Houston stations. So essentially they'll cover uh, almost all of the voting population of Texas. Tippett's is not being invited. And I'm guessing you guys haven't been invited to or there are no debates in your races. Is that correct? That's correct. How do you get a voice when there is no debate, meaning in a, in a state senate or state assembly race, there's very little actual coverage of the campaign in, right. the, in the news media? So what we did in the primary was we set up a candidates forum, uh, which had all the primary candidates, the Libertarian, myself, the other Democrat, and we invited the incumbent Democrat, but he did not decide to attend. Um, so we still had our forum with uh, the three other candidates that are willing to attend. So in that way, we we're able to get that out. And I've asked the incumbent opponent, I've reached out to him to have a one-on-one -on -one debate, because that's what we're left with, with the top two. And he has not returned my call yet. So- Do you anticipate that he ever will? No, he won't. Uh, he's overconfident and in his idea that he's just gonna walk, walk in and win it without doing much besides send out mailers. Um, but we're gonna have debates with an empty chair and we'll be able to ask him questions even though he's not there and if it's just crickets that responds then we'll show that and we'll we'll try and tell the people when we're out there on the streets but that it, he's but not willing to is be. the b or kcra going to cover your the b is debate? very much in his favor already uh, -huh. uh kcra3 we don't have much hope there but we're going to reach out to as many news organizations as possible alternative uh, media as well okay that's what i was going for yeah. is alternative media a way for you to break through the, uh, the essentially the, 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 snow sc the, the smoke screen that's th thrown up by the major media. Yes, absolutely. And utilizing social media at the same time, which, which is blossoming right now, social media is becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, that's something we're going to push out there as well and just show his absence and his unwillingness to debate. He's a doctor. He should be willing to debate a young man that's been out of college for only four years now. And I'm ready to debate, but apparently he's not. Are you ready to debate? Uh, well, the thing is, they'll never give us the time, time or day. Hmm? They'll never give us, the, give us the time or day they even try. So, you know, when it comes down to it, we're actually going to make alternative media that's going <coughs> to make a lot of people have uh, their eyebrows raised, and we're not going to play nice. I mean, I'm planning on doing a campaign that's going to be completely different, and it will make him want to uh, be able to talk to me and debate me, and I'll say, you know what? I don't have time for you. The uh, United Kingdom Independent Party, uh, UKIP, the people who were behind uh, Brexit, the uh, breakaway of Great Britain from, uh, from the U European Union. Uh, there, a couple of their uh, MEPs, uh, a guy by the name of Bill Etheridge, came to, came to uh, Washington, D.C., visited the LP uh, national headquarters, talked to West Benedict, and they uh, were uh, basically discussing what issues we have in common and the primary issue that Britain and uh, the uh, United States have in common is the issue of free trade, which of course uh, has been brought into serious question by the antics of the current president. Where do you stand on free trade? Where do you, I realize this is not a, this is more of a national issue mm -hmm. rather than a state issue, but if you were to uh, opine on the efficacy of free trade versus protectionism, where do you come down? Uh, Scott? Uh, I would say free trade all the way. Why should there be agreements for free trade? That's what I really want to know. I don't understand why some players are allowed to have all the free trade and other ones can't, because that's what free trade agreements do. They allow to have the big players do whatever they want while the small guys don't benefit from those trade policies within those policies, so. Well, I'm an anti-war candidate and I'm against trade wars in addition to regular would, wars. Would you agree with the premise that countries that trade together are much less, much less likely to shoot at each other? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. So trade wars lead to shooting wars you would agree with that? Uh, yeah, and I think that's part of the fear mongering we're seeing right now between you know Russia and the USA uh, with the tariffs. Not to mention China and Mexico. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and our enemies, the Canadians. Right. I also want to mention, too, actually, uh, during World War II, the reason the Japanese even attacked is because there was an embargo on Japanese goods. So right. That's part of the reason why they even attacked Pearl Harbor in the first place. Well, and, and I mean, like it or like him or not, Obama uh, negotiated a uh, an agreement with Iran which purportedly said that Iran would not do as much work on developing nuclear weaponry. Sure. Now, whether or not they were serious, that's up to que you know, open to question, but certainly it's better than what they're doing now, which is overtly and 
purposefully trying to develop nuclear weapons. Sure. And, agree. you know, they're, they're a smart people, uh, you know, a large country, capable of, of causing a great deal of uh, mischief, certainly in the Middle East, if not the rest of the world. Well, especially if Israel being a nearby uh, neighbor, of course, yeah. it can happen any day soon. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on to uh, the, uh, again, national issue, not a state issue. Okay, sure. But there will be parallels uh, in the, in, with the state Supreme Court. I mean, you guys will be asked to uh, take a look at, uh, at various state court or state uh, court nominees, state Supreme Court and, so, and state appellate court uh, judges. The SCOTUS nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, thinks it is just okay to disappear citizens in the name of fighting terrorism. Let me give you the example that I, that I came up with in doing just a little bit of internet okay. research. A guy by the name of Amir Mishal, who is a Somalian by birth, but a natural, but a, but a, uh, uh, a, a naturalized United States citizen, full citizen of the United States. He, he happened to be in Somalia uh, during the uh, recent outbreak of war uh, in Somalia okay. and was trying to escape across the border into Kenya. He was apprehended by uh, American uh, quasi-military forces and uh, questioned uh, and detained for over 30 hours and told that uh, he would be disappeared if he did not cooperate with the, uh, with the, with the spooks. And the case wound its way to the U.S. Supreme Court, ACLU case, saying that his Fourth Amendment's, uh, Amendment rights were clearly being violated, which they were. Uh, and SCOTUS nominee, Trump's nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, uh, ruled that, uh, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's okay to do that kind of thing to uh, an American citizen as long as it happens overseas <laughs> and, and as long as there is, you know, terror is involved. Fears of, for you know, for that kind of overreach on the part of uh, our courts. Well, of course, this is nothing new. Actually, in 2012, there was an updated, uh, I believe, is the National Defense Authorization Act that's signed uh, in by Barack Obama that allowed uh, U.S. citizens to be detained indefinitely without due process. So this is nothing new. This has been happening since the Patriot Act was enacted, essentially. So. Mm -hmm. um, I condemn it all the way. It's a violation of due so process. So you're saying it's not, it's not party specific. No. Both Democrats and Republicans have done it. Right, absolutely. And it's despicable, really. And we shouldn't be, you know, accepting any nominee for Supreme Court that does anything like that. And we can't just pick one issue that maybe you agree with him on and say, okay, well, he's okay then. You know, it's, if, the, if he's saying this, disappearing act, that's, that's completely wrong because it's against our Fourth and Fifth Amendments, as you said. Uh, we've seen all sorts of terrible war crimes and atrocities occur for reasons of national security and that needs to stop because it's basically an elitist group that's performing these atrocities for reasons of national security and it's not for us people that are just trying to survive out here. Final uh, question, this is a question about, about pollution. Air pollution in Yosemite and other national parks is allegedly as bad in the national parks as it is in some of our larger, larger cities. Uh, why would that be, and what would you do about it? Yosemite is right here in California. So. Yeah, I would assume a lot of it has to do with the massive amount of forest fires that we keep having in the state. Um, I think we really need to look at how much money we're spending on taking down these forest fires and how efficient we are doing this, because it seems like we can do a better job of stopping these forest fires. And when it comes to transportation methods. I really want a, an open market to look at different ways to use transportation that's not just reliant on gas and oil uh, that has their fumes. I mean, why can't we open up the transportation uh, sector to solar, to um, steam-powered uh, transportation? I'm not sure that external combustion would be much of an advantage environmentally. Whatever works. You know, I'm not the scientist here, but there's but there there's are, people there with are, ideas out there that are being shut down. Yeah, there are people, I forget the name of it, there's, there's a, an application of motorbikes. Not, not, not motorcycles, but motorbikes, bikes with a little motor on them, yeah. that uh, you can rent by picking them up at point A, drop it off wherever the heck you're going, mm -hmm. and then and with a credit card or with, a, you know, with, a, with an app, oh, yeah, app on your phone, yeah. pick it up, you know, I've wherever. Them, yeah. And I think it's Milwaukee is trying to shut them down because, well, because. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a, a I, problem here, here in California yet, probably will be. Well, recently there was actually, I, I think there are uh, bikes that are being rented out, out here that are orange. I've read mm -hmm. the name yeah, of them. Yeah, in Sacramento. Uh, do you know the name of them? 
No, I'm not sure the name. Okay, well, they actually are taking up parking spots in downtown Sacramento. So they're taking up parking spots to allow these bikes to be there. Yeah. So they're, they're allowing private companies to take our parking spots away. Oh, so you're opposed to that? Well, it's benefiting them. They're giving, giving oh, them yeah. a monopoly. No, it's benefiting, okay, it gives everybody a place to park, right? Well, if you, if you pay for the bike. Oh, okay. It, it's primarily for that company, not, not for bikes by itself. Okay, the, the, the question, of course, that I have is, should the government be trying to pick winners and losers in the transportation space, whether it's fossil fuel or pedal power or solar or whatever? It, it shouldn't be pick, picking anything. I, I think it's, it's not government's job to pick winners and losers in any way. And it's clear they have been yeah. for quite some time. Well, thank you very much. That's the show for this week. We'll see you again next time, same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Absolutely, and that's something that ties in greatly with the candidate I'm running against as well. And I just would like to go into in a little bit more detail. I, you know, I said, you know, we all start out as socialists because, you know, from each according to their uh, ability, to each according to their need, socialists. Babies are all need, parents are all ability. And so, you know, do you agree with that? Or do you think, do you think that that works beyond the family unit? Well, yeah, I agree with that. And I, what socialism means to me is that people are the ones that are going to change this world. And we need people I wish we had more time to debate it. Thank you very much. That's the show. I'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Thank you.